All right, welcome. Welcome to One Million Cups. Woo! So for this almost Independence Day uh, One Million Cups, we have, as usual, two amazing presenters. Who's here for the first time? First time attendees? Ah, welcome, glad you're here. So for those of you who haven't been here, here's how this thing works. We have two presenters here at One Million Cups, first half hour, then the second half hour. Each of them has six minutes to uh, present something about themselves, and then we go into 20 minutes of Q&A. So it's a really cool format. So as usual, we like to thank our hosts in this fine space, Kaufman Foundation. A little hand for the Kaufman Foundation. And because the Kaufman Foundation has fantastic people that bring us coffee and clean up after us, just make their job a little easier, and don't be a slob. Take all your trash and things and put them in a proper receptacle. It will be appreciated by all of us. All right, moving on. Enough with the announcements. So uh, who here likes coffee? Of course you do, that's why you're here. So, you know, at One Million Cups, we like coffee too. So we like to celebrate those that bring us the important morning juice, which is coffee, not anything of, of, from any fruits. Uh, although that's a bean, it still is a fruit, isn't it? I'm not looking at you guys, you're not the guys. I don't know, Gregory will know. So we're bringing up somebody who is closely involved in, uh, in bringing coffee culture to Kansas City uh, and doing a, um, and trying to, you know, elevate, trying to make it the best it can possibly be. So please welcome Gregory from Oddly Correct. Thank you. Greetings, everybody. My name is Gregory Colsto, and I am um, owner and cultural facilitator of Oddly Correct Coffee in Midtown Kansas City. We are a community of coffee professionals that are like-minded in the sense that we are pursuing excellence through coffee, or working towards that end anyway. So we're located on Westport and Main Street. Um, interesting neighborhood. It's our neighborhood. We love it. And we're trying to, as we say, kick ass in coffee um, for the city. So can I say that on stage? OK, good. All right, good. So this is kind of our, our living mission statement that lives above our bar at our coffee bar. We look up at it every day because it is about putting to death complacency and mediocrity that's inherent in us, that keeps us on the couch, keeps us from um, pursuing excellence, really. It's a thing that keeps us from speaking when we should speak. Um, and so we kind of geek out on that thing. And uh, that's that. So a little history about me. Um, Starbucks 1995 had real espresso machines back then. It was kind of a fun thing. Um, 1999, took an apprenticeship in coffee in the Chicagoland area. Learned how to roast coffee really dark, um, which is important. Um, and then that company was a family-owned company, started to grow and tried to perceive, be perceived as like a giant, right? And it worked because Krispy Kreme then purchased them after that. And we moved down to North Carolina and kind of like tried to take on Howard Schultz's empire uh, with coffee and donuts. It didn't work. It's always a bad idea to take them on, right? Or is it? Broadway did it and they won. So um, anyway, Krispy Kreme then um, began roasting the coffee, built a team, built a factory, um, became their green coffee buyer. And that sort of ignited um, my passion for coffee deeper as I started to learn the who, what, where, and the people in the place and the thing of coffee. Um, the amount of work that goes into every cup of coffee that we're drinking here today is mind-blowing. Um, the amount of lives it impacts is amazing, so pretty important. Um, <laughs> then, like all of us, there comes a breaking point in our lives, right, as we think about starting something and what really quality of life is all about. Um, I experienced the velvet handcuffs of a big paycheck, a big title, and a big office, and I was like, I'm an art school dropout. We need to get back to our roots of roasting coffee. So I moved to Kansas City and um, helped a small company grow. We talked about leaving the hills of North Carolina for the culture of Kansas City, which is rich, right? It is an amazing, uh, freaky, little gemmy underbelly of a dragon um, that is slowly collecting gems. And I think this room is filled with them. Um, and Tim Keller talks about culture. He says, as, this culture, as a culture goes, as the city goes, or so goes the city, as goes the culture. Another writer said, as coffee goes, so goes the city. So I think coffee and people and ideas are really important. So 
happy to be here as well. Back to the point. Um, we, after two years of working for that company, we realized if we couldn't create a company that we agreed with 100%, we would have to facilitate one ourselves, which began um, with a really small roaster, a very functional. Um, you don't need much to get started. So we got a couple coffee shops and restaurants to take us on. We're very thankful for that. Some of them are still with us today. Um, we were a wholesale roaster, which is basically, you know, you're roasting coffee, you're bringing in the back door of restaurants and cafes. It was great. Got to know a lot of people. But um, the main thrust of our business has been expand as we succeed. Like we're so tempted to buy something large and hope that we can fill it and compromise perhaps what we're all about, our soul, in order to grow and, and go crazy. Instead, we kind of like, as we say, dirtbagged it. And we expanded as we succeeded. Our first place was we roasted in a garage. Then we moved to a hole in the wall behind Davies Uptown Ramblers Club. Then we moved into our art studio in the west side. And then our, our next location um, was a payday loans in Midtown, which we were very happy to gut. Um, it kind of whack a mold and popped up six miles north. But anyway, um, we're happy to gut it. So kind of fast forward to a couple years ago, um, we brought on my uh, good friend, Mike Schroeder, who's a very smart man and a good coffee roaster. He's roasting all our coffee right now. Uh, nice work. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we did, um, because we didn't have to open a coffee shop, we got to open a coffee shop. And that was a big difference. The backbone of our business was wholesale roasting. Um, therefore, uh, we didn't have to do something in order to like feed the monkey yet. Um, so what we focused on doing was just open the door. And no matter where we were, whether it was the garage or the hole in the wall behind the rock club or whatever, people found us. And so we opened our doors, and retail really changed our game, allowed us to meet you of Kansas City, and really fell in love even deeper. Um, but what we did was we focused on pour over style coffee, which at the time was emerging in Kansas City. Thankfully, now it's very available, and there's a lot of amazing coffee in our city. Um, and we focused only on that and kind of just had 30 minutes in between the next customer that wandered in. So we really got to know our early customers really well. We'll fast forward to now. Um, or actually, in the middle of that, there's this sort of thing, right? So the, the soul of our brand is also art and sort of imagery where you saw the crocodile man. Um, we are also letterpress printers. We brand everything with our uh, hands, and it's kind of fun. Um, Next thing, we had this opportunity in, um, on 3940 Main Street, where it was a, a corner spot. Our team grew, we destroyed it, and we built it back up to this beautiful cafe, um, where we are really interested in creating an experience that's somewhat new. We're interested in curating a coffee experience, in the sense that if we have a warehouse, we have a million items that we probably suck at preparing half of them. So instead, we have taken 11 things, and that is our menu, and we have focused on those things, um, curated in the sense that coffee is our art, and we want to present our art in a way that it is best shown in our eyes. So the, um, that's what we focused on, is just really preparing an excellent beverage. And it's really interesting, the, the interaction we have with people over that, because we do, there's a, at the Nelson, if you go down towards the modern section, there is a giant tapestry you stand back, you're like, oh, that's cool. I don't understand fiber, but it's cool. And then you walk a little closer, and you realize that it's not fiber at all. It's not woven. It's literally like smashed bottle tops and labels tied together. Amazing. What we want to do is sort of take a step back and say, what is a coffee bar? What is a coffee shop? What should I experience? When I go to the Rieger, I don't say, like, can I get a hamburger? I'm like, what's amazing? And they look me in the eye, and they freak out, and they tell me how amazing the food is. And so that's kind of the approach we're taking. What is a coffee shop? Um, there and so just some of the other things we do we we just we use um, we try to underdo our competition right by offering only whole milk we really don't have milk alternatives but we have awesome customers and competitors and community people that do so we tend to point people towards that so um, it's kind of a liberating thing to literally just do what you're good at um, because we want to actually do it for you um, lastly what we're into doing is teaching um, so we do a lot of classes we have a curriculum of how to like learn all our secrets you know, in coffee and how to pursue your own thing at home. Um, talking about basically like a cookbook, right? The chef is going to teach you all their secrets. They're not scared. So we actually want to blow your mind. Uh, next thing is basically collaborations. We're really excited about, again, the, the culture that's in Kansas City. Um, Brady Vest is an amazing letterpress printer as well. So we've collaborated with them on a couple of projects. Right now we've got one where we pursued uh, 
heirloom varietals of coffee and sort of paired up an eight color print and a limited edition coffee and just went for it, you know. Um, lastly, we do, we're kind of interested in just geeking out on coffee, so we pr created this hop toddy product. It's a hop infused cold press coffee. And uh, so we love craft beer and we love coffee, so that kind of works well together. Check it out. And then lastly, uh, Howard, everybody meet Craig Howard when he was here. Um, he did a great job. We, he preached the gospel of good greens at our shop. We have a beautiful space, and I guess my point is we love seeing people in it doing what they do. Um, and lastly, we're just going to keep continuing to pursue excellence um, as a company, do what we do, and kick some ass like Tyler is right there. Um, and so again, we're, uh, we're really just here to introduce ourselves. Um, we're interested in what you guys are interested in. We want to hear about it. So that's kind of the beauty of the hand brewing process. We have three and a half minutes with you um, to learn about your life, and we can talk about coffee. You pick what we talk about. Um, and then just thanks to our team, a uh, bunch of freaks and geeks and beautiful wives. Um, so there you go. Thank you very much. Great stuff, Gregory. Who's got a question for Gregory? Way back there. Great socks, by the way. Great presentation. Um, first of all, we spoke briefly the other day at uh, Arlie Correct's main space. Yeah. Really nice cup of coffee, great experience. Coffee in a beaker, never seen it before. Pretty awesome. Um, I appreciate that you guys, your, your motto of expanding as you succeed. Any chance we could get you guys to break that motto and bring your coffee to the Startup Village? We are in dire need of a, uh, of a right. cafe to replace Eddie's. Yeah, man. That, um, you know, this, I just told myself to discipline myself. I'm not going to talk about it in my mind this year. Like the end of 2013, so maybe I'll break that rule. But um, really, we want to marinate in what we're doing and just kind of continue to develop the neighborhood of, of Main Street and that. But, um, as we succeed, things happen. So the answer is maybe. And those are amazing socks, by the way. Question to your right. So I'm so happy to see one of my neighbors up there on the stage. Um, shout out to Hyde Park, to Squire Park. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> So I've uh, visited your shop, and I'm one of those who, unfortunately, my coffee has to be about this color for mm -hmm. me to drink it. And so um, I had to kind of go through the lesson of why uh, you guys don't have milk for those of us um, who add it afterwards. Is there any possibility that you might ease us into your culture and, <laughs> and help us um, kind of get there where yeah, you are um, by, by maybe, I don't know, being a little more flexible on that end of things? <laughs> uh, well, n the, the short answer is no, but <laughs> because... Because we're looking to elevate the experience in our minds of uh, coffee to that of beer and wine. You know, we go and we've learned to adjust our palate. Like you're saying, the way I'll help you is I'll buy your coffee and we'll talk about it. And we'll slowly ease into that. But no, um, we don't really want to be known even as the coffee shop that doesn't offer cream and sugar. But um, we want to be known as the coffee company who's buying and roasting coffees that are sweet and complex and amazing. Um, and that's really the thing. But that's a, funny, that's a funny thing. So yes, we will buy your coffee and we'll talk about it. If you'll give it a go, we'll do it. Question right over here. Yeah. Uh, I've heard lately about bulletproof coffee. I was wondering if you had an opinion. Bulletproof. No, it's a great name. Are they a company? It's a concoction of coconut oil, uh, butter, and coffee. It's supposed to be good for you, and it's supposed <laughs> to be beans that are... I don't know, and that's what I was asking the professional. I am fascinated by it now. Uh, no, but thank you. <laughs> um, so I just finally saw Jiro Dreams of Sushi last night. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's on my mind, and uh, I'm seeing a lot of sort of parallels in sort of the the values that you're talking about, and just sort of the 
wanting to do better and have a better experience for your customers and really get to know your craft. Um, so when trying to come up with a question around all that, yeah. um, I kind of want to hear you talk about apprenticeship because you talked about kind of your history um, and the people that you learned from. And I, I also want to know how and if you're passing that on, if you have sort of an apprenticeship program. Uh, you talked about classes, but do you have sort of more focused stuff? Yeah, um, apprenticeship, I mean, that was a modern American apprenticeship, right? So like, you can, it's kind of trial by fire. Um, it was great, and it's sort of like an ongoing apprenticeship for me, even in coffee and business. So we don't have an apprenticeship program. Um, Mike, as I said, he roasted coffee already and kind of came in, and coffee is a lot about science, but it's also a lot about the gut. Um, so coming back to like a purity of, of, of focus in there, um, we're five years old, and as we kind of go forward, we are um, interested in bringing people in that are, you know, of that mind. So, good question. Apprenticeship. Um, so no, no, no official apprenticeship program. Actually, I have a question. You over here on your left. Hello. Um, you you're five years into it, and you've talked about. Uh, really a lot of the pleasures and the experiences and the reason that you've done things and kind of your philosophy behind it and, and the culture that you're providing. What are some of the challenges? What were the things that were in your way? What were the things that, that made it hard to create a location or made it hard to, to source you know, good product? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, a, a lot of it is, was my own mind, you know, the status quo that like back to the crocodile man that's always trying to grind us back down to the easiest, the path of least resistance. Um, sourcing is great because there is a lot of great coffee out there. Um, the challenges are obviously like sometimes capital, sometimes um, time. Um, and I think that the biggest challenge really is just sort of trying to affect a culture sort of with love. Um, decide what you want to do, draw a line in the sand and move forward from that. Um, so I think the challenge really is just the daily boots on the ground battle um, for a your joy as coffee drinkers, but also as just kind of um, giving the finger to the status quo and um, pursuing excellence in that way. I have a question for you. Oh, oh. Nope. yours. Yeah. Good morning. Hi. I was wondering if you are you guys expanding outside of your cafe? Where's your coffee available? and also your other products like your craft beer. Are there plans to move outside of the cafe? Um, we do. We have a lot of, um, there's a coffee shop called Quay in the, oh no, it's Key, isn't it? Just kidding. No, uh, Key in the River Market, um, Little Freshy. Uh, what are some other ones? Help me out here. Thank you. Mud pie. I can never remember offhand. We have a, a probably about 12 really awesome wholesale accounts who are, are doing a good job. Um, so that is that. Does that kind of answer your question there? You can look on our website. We have a list of our wholesale customers, um, and then we do mail order. We do bike delivery to homes on the weekend, um, and then you know beer. We have dreams of um, having a few beers on tap at the shop and having a couple hours later. Um, the other thing I should mention is our hours were like seven to three. They used to be seven to one, which is amazing um, for us because we could pursue the rest of our day. We could work on the rest of our work. Now it's sort of a challenge because we have created a monkey that's hungry and uh, wants, wants more of us. But um, that's why we close at 3 so that we can kind of do the rest of our work and have a quality of life uh, beyond our shop. Does that help you? Thank you. Question for you over here. Yep. Gregory, I love this place. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the fabric of culture and food, and especially coffee, and how you've seen that begin to inform each other, so to speak, and how does that encourage your vision, and what do you see beyond that? Yeah, Kansas City's rich, right? We have so many amazing restaurants and, and eaters, really, right, who are hungry for something new. Um, we collaborate a little bit with, like, Port Fonda and Bread KC, and they do amazing stuff. Like, we're coffee people, and we can talk about what's what that tastes like, right? What, what combines well with that? Um, I'm really excited about pushing the boundaries of what coffee is. Like, if you've ever listened to the square pusher, like, he makes me think, what's the difference between sound and music? And so, like, there's a lot of exciting culinary things happening with coffee. Does that answer your question? Another question in the back. As someone who grew up on Seinfeld, I'm wondering why you didn't just call it coffee Nazi. Yeah. Because you're, you're pretty fierce. No coffee for you. Uh, and a little stubborn, maybe, uh, when, when 
customers are suggesting new things. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering about, I, I love your graphics. I think that's one of your strongest things. Do you print those yourself, or do you go down on the boulevard and have th that press place do it? Would you tell me a little more about your artwork. Sure, yeah. We, um, we have a letterpress little shop in our roasting space at 3934 Main. Um, and so all of that stuff comes from my brain pretty much unfiltered, which is another beautiful opportunity that we have, you know, to, I, I, I'm really interested in kind of curating your coffee cupboard in the morning, right? We're, we're sort of doing our thing. Hopefully we're not. Hopefully we're really excited about where we're going, but want to have a compelling and interesting image on your coffee bag. And as far as being a coffee Nazi, you know, like, I hear where you're coming from and I kind of agree some days, but like, because we really want to make people happy. Um, the great news about Kansas City is there's great coffee everywhere, and like we're sort of just a weird museum, right, of strange, like, you know, beautiful coffee things. Um, so our biggest thing is we don't want to be weird and we don't want to be um, hard on you, but we do want to, in love, ask you to like kind of join us on the adventure of trying something new. Is that helpful? No? <laughs> Come in, we'll talk later. I'll help you. Up, up here, up front. First of all, I'd like to say congratulations on blowing Kansas City's mind in terms of coffee. Thanks. So here's a little esoteric question. You've done all these really mind-blowing things. You've really stretched the envelope in terms of coffee and beverages and experiences here in Kansas City, and I feel like you've really started up this new revolution around coffee. What's next? What's, what's this little ember that's glowing in your soul? What's the next big frontier or the next idea that you have? If you can tip people off that. And I will respect you for not sharing. Too. Okay. Well, yeah, like right now, we, so no, I'm not going to tell you. To her point. No, um, no I, think, I think right now we want to focus on our team, right? The cool thing about having a, a company is you can create opportunities for other people who are hungry, right? And like, so I want to focus on like creating a culture of a company that is um, and, uh, healthy, right? Work, life, family, balance, play. And that's so hard, right, when you're hitting it hard. And um, I don't believe you can create culture, but I think that you can create space for culture to exist as a cross-section of the context you create. So we're trying to create a context for a company that's healthy and like, and profitable and sustainable and fun. Question for you right here. So I love living in a city where something like oddly correct can exist. Um, but I, I think that the vast majority of people in the morning, their, uh, their coffee is fuel. They might pick it up at quick trip, as horrifying as that is, or Dunkin' Donuts here. Um, <coughs> but, um, you know, I just, I'm curious to know a little bit about your market research process. You've done a brick and mortar play in a prominent location, uh, and I can't believe that you would have gone into something like that with significant overhead if, with a, if we build it, they will come kind of an attitude. So, um, do you feel like you are sustainable? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question, right? But that was our method, like, we built it because they came, you know, like, that's been our whole philosophy the whole way long, uh, across. We also believe in, like, that neighborhood, right, it's, we have people peeing in trash cans and literally, you know, and so, like, there, and, and there's, it's just, that opens up the whole world of city culture that's really challenging, right, um, because we actually want to get to know our homeless and, and, you know, somehow increase their quality of life without giving them money for booze, right, so that's sort of our, our context. But market research, man, it's just because of the experience of what I've done it, um, and really believe that if you um, can create something excellent, that will breed excellence, right? And like, I'm not saying our coffee is um, the end of it all, but it is. We're opening the door, hopefully, for a new culture of Kansas City coffee companies to come in and just really kill it anywhere, right? Does that answer your question? Cool, man. So um, my name is Nate, and I'm, you know, blessed enough to be able to serve you guys and, and run One Million Cups nationally. And uh, a lot of people don't know that, you know, half of our locations are actually run out of coffee shops. And, um, you know, obviously we're too big for any coffee shop here. Um, but I was lucky enough to uh, be asked earlier this year to speak in Columbia at, at TEDx Columbia about the uh, social life of coffee and entrepreneurship and took a sort of a historical approach looking at um, how coffee shops really spurred the Enlightenment in the 1650s, you know, in England, uh, in Oxford. And, um, and what does that look like today? And so with working in a coffee shop with like 
really being a place uh, to grow culture, to grow your neighborhood, to bring people into this journey. What types of like innovative things are you seeing uh, happen, like collaborations that wouldn't otherwise happen because of your space? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, I, I love um, the fact because you know you, you make something and it's yours, but the moment you open the door or you sing the song, you put the painting out there, it's no longer yours. And that gestalt, right, of like, we talk a lot about like the front of the cow and the back of the cow. We're the back of the cow, of course. Customer is the front of the cow. And what makes that a whole cow, if you take the front and the back, is our mind, right? Our experience, what you bring. Um, and I think coffee, it's just been great to watch people come in and fill the space we had hoped that they would. So I guess, you know, specifically, I don't even know. Like, I know that people keep coming back and falling in love and fighting and, you know, all these things in this space. Um, but in terms of innovation, um, we're really excited about opportunities to grow with coffee farmers. And we had a, a friend who's a Costa Rican coffee farmer who started. Does that answer your question somewhat? I mean, kind of like the, the multiplier effect of one coffee shop is huge. Like, I don't think people really think about that that much, but like, you know, Joe Smith and myself come in, we meet each other, we wouldn't have otherwise met because of this space, and he's got a great idea, we share it, and then, you know, two years later, five years later, we're in business together, yeah. you know, it's like those types of interactions. So I think it's just really interesting because I'm, like, this speaks exactly into what I'm trying to promote and build yeah. with this, so. Yeah, I guess that, that's a question I don't know the answer to, right? We've been open in this new space for six months, and I, I guess what I can say is, like, all of the people that I do recognize and know because of that, and have been able to connect just by saying, I'm busy here, talk to this guy, he's amazing, right? And they're like, and so that's the really interesting culture that's happened. As we become more busy, we've lost a little bit of that because of just being busy. Um, but the fruit of relationship that we've seen around in this place has been amazing. So yeah, to that point, man, I'm, I'm blown away. And we're excited about being able to create a space that that can happen in. All right, and with that, we're out of time. Thank you, Gregory. All right, moving right along. That was great. I love being able to um, connect with men like that in our community and the women that are also out doing amazing ventures. So is Luke here with Code for America? Got an announcement? Hi there, I'm uh, Luke Norris with Code for America that many of you probably know is a San Francisco-based nonprofit that puts technologists, developers, designers, et cetera, in year-long fellowships in local governments to help them become more innovative, better leverage technology, people in the power of the web. And uh, those of you who have maybe seen uh, some of our fellows here in Kansas City, you've seen some of the work that they've been able to do and the incredible experience. So wanted to share with you that uh, we have applications open until the end of the month for our 2014 fellows. Uh, we are very excited about trying to showcase some of the development, design, coding, and hacking talent from Kansas City. So if you know of anyone that's interested, uh, please encourage them to go to codeforamerica.org slash apply and uh, check out the fellowship. It's an incredible opportunity to work with some of the biggest thought leaders in technology, government, and also work hand in hand with some of the most innovative cities around the US. So please help us spread the word. And if you know of anyone or if you're interested, go to codeforamerica.org slash apply. Thanks. Thanks. Well, thank you all for coming this morning. This is really exciting. And um, last week, we had a very big announcement for One Million Cups nationally. And I want to reiterate that announcement. Um, we've partnered with a new programs, the first program of its kind uh, for radio called Dream Big America. What that means is all the One Million Cups companies that come through our program nationally have the ability to be nominated by the community organizers to go on a national radio show um, that reaches about 3.5 million people per week. Um, and they get to talk about their companies. And then uh, it's three entrepreneurs a week, nine per month, and it's narrowed down to the top three, and then there will be a winner. And the coolest thing that makes it unique is that um, America gets to vote. 
America gets to vote on the ideas that should exist and should rise to the top. And so we're extremely excited to partner with Dream Big America. Um, I want to invite the team up to show their, their teaser video and then to announce the first company that's going to be from Kansas City on the radio program. So Dream Big America team, why don't you guys come up and um, we'll get this video kicked off. All right, we're gonna play this video for you guys. Quick teaser. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Adam Taff. I'm here on behalf of Dream Big America, who is partnering with the Kauffman Foundation to put on the first ever live, national, syndicated radio show that gives entrepreneurs a voice. Think of American Idol meets Shark Tank without Simon Cowell doing the things that he does. Actually, it's going to be in that regard, just the opposite. It's all about supporting entrepreneurs, which is the mission of One Million Cups. We're extremely excited to be a part of this. Um, Doug Steffen is a national radio host who has a long-standing show that reaches three and a half million people every week. He's a renaissance guy. He's old school, nouveau, very interesting, and really a, a terrific host for this program, and it's really exciting. Here is the Dream Big America team. They're gonna be here today. Please ask them questions if you have any. Um, but today's all about the announcement of the first three companies that have been selected from all over the country to be on the first show. So, let's just go over the format really quickly. I think that's probably my role there. Hey, the three things that, that make this work, listen, vote, and participate. The show is on 480, in 485 markets across the country on Doug Steffen's Good Day Show. For those of us in this room, it's probably just as easy to listen syndicated on the podcast on dreambigamerica.us. It's every Tuesday morning from 9.10 to 9.40 Eastern, so in Kansas City, 8.10 to 8.40 Central Time, live. How does this thing work? As Nate said, we vote. We empower the American public to select the business venture that they believe they want in their markets, that they want in their street corners, that they want in their hospitals, that they want in the grocery store, that they want working nonprofits and making a difference in their community. Gets back to the adage of, if you've got an idea and you're willing to work hard in this country, if it's good enough, we as a society want to empower you and will benefit from us getting that to the top. Voting is live for 28 hours after the show. That gives the whole country one full day to vote. And then two days later, we announce the winner every week. Each weekly winner, as Nate says, goes to the final program at the end of the week. And there we have a weekly or a monthly finals winner. And that winner receives cash, support, and material to help boost their entrepreneurial effort. So participate. If you want to get on the show, as Nate said, become a presenter at one of the One Million Cups organizations or talk to us and we'll, we'll point you in the right direction. Also, like the Dream Big America Facebook page. It's a little cliche, but that's actually where you'll get updates on who's going to be on the show and a notice when voting starts, and probably importantly, when there's one hour left for voting to go. All right, you ready to hear about who's going to be on the first show? Pretty exciting, but... All right, first, from Portland, Oregon, Conscious Box, who will be presented by their CEO, Patrick Kelly. Really innovative company that brings environmentally friendly and nutritious products and all facets of the market to your box so you can sample them and decide which products you want to exchange for the ones that, shall we say, maybe aren't so environmentally friendly that are part of your daily uh, routine. Really innovative company. I think you're going to really enjoy hearing about uh, Conscious Box. Number two, from Aliso Viejo, California, which if you're like me, I wasn't exactly sure where that is. It's just south of Orange County. Stimulation. Stimulation is the first luxury skincare product that uses adult stem cell technology to not only provide a healthy product, but to rejuvenate and help heal some of your skin issues. 
Very interesting company, uses cut, uh, cutting edge technology on a product that a lot of us can relate to. And little drum roll, please. Number three, from Kansas City, Missouri, presented at One Million Cups previously, My ED Match, be, uh, presented by Alicia Harold, the CEO. Alicia, are you here today? I think you're here today. Hey, will you stand up, Alicia? Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. And it's, it's Kauffman Foundation obviously is an amazing partner in this venture, as we all understand. But every company across the country gets to earn the right to be on the show on their own merits. And My ED Match is an amazing company. It matches teachers and school districts from across the nation based on their, their, their desires, their passions, and the correct fit for them. Who doesn't benefit from having good teachers in our schools? So it's going to be a great show. I mean, there's three amazing companies to kick off this program, and I think you're going to really enjoy it. So I encourage you to participate in any way you can, and uh, thank you to Kauffman Foundation, and have a great Fourth of July. Thanks, Nate. Wonderful. Congratulations, my ed match. Like, that's very, very awesome. We're really excited to have somebody representing Kansas City nationwide to that audience. Um, so a little backstory on our next presenter as we get their computer set up and their presentation going. Um, Overcities is a company that is filling the gap between, um, I'm sure everybody here is familiar with Google Maps, Google Earth, Skycam view, you can spy on your neighbors, all that creepy stuff. Um, they're filling the gap between that and the street view. Like if you go to the street view, you can see the roads and everything. These guys have come up with a system, they're entirely self-funded, um, and they are flying over the cities Kansas City is one of those cities. We'll talk about that here in a minute. But they're filling in that gap so that you can have a bird's eye view of your um, downtown area, your suburbs area, so that when you're going to either a vacation spot, you're trying to find somebody down on the plaza, but you don't know exactly where such and such restaurant is, you can hook up to their system and have a bird's eye view like you're flying over the space yourself. And you can see all the different buildings um, in relationship to each other. So without any further ado, we're going to have William Hayes come up and tell you more about what they're doing and the great things that are to come. How's it going? Thank you. Uh, my name's William Hayes. And like you said, I am a partner with Over Cities. And we are based here in Kansas City and basically here today to talk about our new project. And uh, we've been working now for quite a few years developing this technology. And we'll just kind of dig right in and give you guys a quick preview. So what we've done is we've actually created a new technology and a new system and format for shooting aerial imagery. So we're able to specialize in high definition, low altitude aerial imagery in a 360 format. So what this does now is it allows us to take phenomenal imagery of Kansas City in a full 360 format and really get to understand how the city is laid out and really start to connect those dots. Now what we do is we specialize in almost a static viewpoint. So no more flying around like Google, we really allow you to get your bearings. So what we've done is we've created a simple way to navigate a city. And if you look at these little yellow markers, each one is a new 360 degree tour. So what you can do is in one click now, you can go from tour to tour and understand the whole city. And what we've done to make things a little more interesting now is we've figured out with our new technology how to integrate our aerial imagery into Bing Maps and Google Maps so that now you can jump back and forth and control your viewpoint and really understand where you're going, what things look like. So the easiest way, in one click, now we get smooth transitions that take you from district to district, neighborhood to neighborhood, and it allows you now to really understand the layout of that city. Let's see if we get a good internet connection. So this is one thing about, we are in our beta test, and uh, we just did a soft launch this week. So we are still working through a couple issues which have to, have to do with latency. But what's really neat is, I'll go back here, is as you're looking around here, you can go full screen. You can come down here to hotspots. So hotspots are our interpretation of how you find a city and how you find a business. So now you can scroll over that business, you get this little tool that comes up and it'll explain what it is, where that business is, and in two, in one simple step, you can now go inside that business and really take a tour and get that really good understanding of what that city and what that business has to bring to Kansas City. 
Now, a little difference between us and Google is we're really focused on high quality imagery. We spend a lot of time to make sure that our photo shoots look very good and are high res. And we back ended all that with social media. So as soon as this loads, we'll be able to go inside, take a look around, and then if we want to, we can share that view. And <laughs> we are going a little bit slow today. So I think what we'll do is, just in case this happened, we had a backup. So we actually have a video that we put together that shows how everything will work, where we're going with this technology. And... I do apologize that that went a little fast, but it's a lot better than uh, the internet freezing up on us. So I think kind of what we were trying to do is have that ability to really showcase that city. Uh, we'll go here and see if this is working and then we'll just kind of jump right into the Q&A. Um, but with this technology, what it allows us to do is really fill that void. Uh, there hasn't been a company around that allows you to really see a city for what it is. Uh, Google is a phenomenal tool but uh, with their satellite imagery and everything is built around 3D modeling, it doesn't give you that fair representation of the city. And our goal, we kind of look at ourselves almost like the, uh, we are the cliff notes to Google and uh, to really allow you to get the really quick, vibrant understanding, simple, detailed of uh, how beautiful a city is. And uh, we are on a goal to launch multiple cities. Um, we currently have over Chicago and over Kansas City Live. And uh, we've already shot Miami and Fort Lauderdale and New York, our next markets that we're rolling out to. So um, we actually did a soft launch this week. And uh, somehow yesterday, we had a little glitch in one of our software that uh, is having some latency issues. So it's kind of the, the things that you deal with with startups and uh, working with new technology that's never existed. So I think I'll just kind of jump right into questions and um, see if that goes a little smoother. <laughs> Good question. First one right here for you. Over to your right. Hi. Hi. So I have an almost unnatural love for the new Kit Bond Bridge. Yes. Is that one of? <laughs> I could just stare at it all day, and there's no <laughs> like safe place to just park and stare at it. So is that one of the? Um... It will be. Okay. Uh, we just reshot the city, and we'll be doing shoots as things progress. And that is a beautiful bridge, and it really ties well into the river market area. So what we're trying to do is really encapsulate the things that make Kansas City, Kansas City. Uh, on our site right now, obviously you can go to downtown, you can go all the way out to Zona Rosa, Briarcliff, Worlds of Fun, the stadiums, on out to the racetrack in Kansas down to 151st. 
So again, we're not trying to emulate Google by any means. We do not want people going to looking in their homes. What we're really trying to focus on are the key aspects that make a city really tick. And then do two or three tours in each suburb that kind of really showcase all the hot spots. All, our goal is to really let you see the hotels, the restaurants, the theaters, how they're interconnected. This is a great thing for Kansas City and the CVA piece because uh, Kansas City has a really hard time of getting people here to Kansas City. And if you, you can talk to the CVA and they'll tell you, if we can get them here, they love it. They, they'll say, I had no idea Kansas City was this beautiful. I mean, there's billions and billions of dollars coming into Kansas City, but nobody knows about it. And so what we're trying to do is take the same technology and that same love for a specific city and really grow and show a city for what it is. Over here on your left. So there are some um, sort of automatic spots that you would do downtown Crossroads Plaza, thing like that. How do you choose your hot spots and where you're going to go? And the reason I ask this is I live um, off Independence Avenue, which is not typically thought of as a hot spot, but if you want an ethnic restaurant, you want to go to Independence Avenue. So how do you pick the places that you highlight? Flip a coin. No, we, we really listen to our people. We actually have a section within here that is a suggest a business. And if we get enough interest from a certain area that we're missing, we will go and we'll shoot that and add that. Um, if we don't have that covered in our aerial imagery, what we'll do is we have elevated the ability to do elevated tours. So we can go up to a rooftop and do like a 19-foot elevated that still shows the community, and then you get down inside each business. And that's the other neat thing about this, and I'll show you, on our mapping piece, um, it not only shows the aerial tours, but now it shows the businesses as well. So even if we're a couple blocks away or even a mile away, we can still put it on our map and then show where it sits in relationship to that aerial tour. So even if we're a few miles away, we can still incorporate that and give people that understanding. And that is our goal. I mean, we really, you know, we really want to showcase the local, what, what makes Kansas City, Kansas City. Um, we're really not going after all the corporate um, companies. You're not going to find a cheesecake on here. We really want to try and work with the local community and really get in deep with the crossroads. Uh, big fan of uh, West Side uh, River Market. So really trying to just showcase Kansas City for what it is. Question right here. When do you plan on contacting Apple? This is where they failed with their maps. Their maps, I use them all the time. I think they're amazing, but this is where they failed. And I think you could be, you know, you could bridge that gap. Uh, funding. Yeah, that, that's the biggest issue is we are purely self-funded, no VC money. Um, you're looking at our 401k. And uh, my partners, there's four of us that created this company. We've taken zero dollars. Um, everything that we've done is in-house ourselves. Um, from product design, concept, marketing, branding, web dev, everything. And the big thing is, is just we are waiting to get to a certain point and then we'll go after some additional funding. Um, it takes a lot of money to go into 100 cities. But we also have revenue models built into it where in the next six months we should be looking pretty good. And uh, we've, I think we have four different revenue models to help bring funds in once the site is really up and going. And it just takes usership. Um, we, and, um, the big piece is just we keep reinvesting into our technology. Uh, we're on, I think, version five. And how all this happened is, we, like I said, we're from here in Kansas City. We created over KC four years ago. But it was very basic technology. And um, technology hadn't caught up with our dreams yet. So we kind of stepped back a little. And uh, since we had over cities, we knew we had to be in multiple cities. And so we picked Chicago, which you saw in that video, to be our next city to launch in. And um, we picked Chicago because it's kind of like Kansas City's sister city, and it shows extremely well. So we went to Chicago, we spent a year and a half just retooling everything from scratch. Got it to where we wanted, came back to Kansas City, decided it wasn't good enough, and then spent another six months beefing up a few more pieces, and then literally just this week did our soft launch. And uh, we've got a big launch party August 14th down at the Midland where um, Quixotic is going to be doing a private performance to kind of kick everything off. So we have another month to kind of fine tune and then it's off to the races. Another question in the back to your left. Um, real quick, a lot of what you guys are doing is um, what I would see as potentially being proprietary. And if you could touch a little bit on 
if you guys have applied for any um, tech patents or process patents and what you guys are doing, as well as go into a little bit of your revenue model. I'm kind of curious as to how you guys are going to make money moving forward. And then what is ultimately your, your exit? Is it, you know, to an Apple like um, the gentleman over here mentioned, or do you guys have plans to, to keep this? Uh, I guess we'll start off with our patents. We are patent pending, and we've filed quite a few trademarks, and um, we try and protect ourselves as much as we can. Because it is imagery and photography, it does come with a few more creative licenses that are automatically included. But uh, we're very good friends with Posanelli, and uh, give them a lot of money. But <laughs> let's say they extend a lot of credit. Um, but no, it's, it's something that's very near and dear to us. And we've spent a lot of money and a lot of time creating the camera rig, I think is what is really the piece. The camera rig that we've created allows us to shoot a whole city in three to four hours. And uh, so that's kind of, and what that does is it allows you to get this kind of imagery now. And this is our low res stuff. So our big files are about 100 megs each. Uh, so we've had to really dumb it down to get it to a system that will allow us to upload in about two megs. And here's one of the neat pieces that we did was we were able to get a deal with the Royals and able to be on the field on opening day and do a shoot during the game. Um, let's see if we'll get it to open. And uh, it took quite a few months to talk them into and convince them that we were a little different. And because uh, Google is not even allowed to do this. So there's, there's a lot of neat things that we're kind of bringing to the table that really showcase Kansas City differently, if it will work. So this is what we really, this I think is what embodies our technology the best, uh, being able to deliver images and viewpoints that people don't normally get to see and really start to explain, you know, why is it worth while to go <laughs> to Kansas City. And our boys are doing good this year. And now we can take this a step farther. And if we wanted to, we can go through each and every single player and almost do like a baseball card. So when you scroll over that baseball player, you can see who it is, what they play, how they're doing. We can make it as interactive as you want. While, while you're letting that load, I'm going to, one more question here on the left. Uh, first of all, congratulations on commercializing such an incredible technology. Uh, this Thank you. is obviously a, a cut above the others in its space. Um, I get that you're doing this for, you know, marketing of civic amenities, of, uh, you know, putting the best face forward for cities. But what you're doing also has, uh, in my mind, great potential to help with parts of the city uh, that might not be as attractive uh, from the air and might not be uh, something that the city necessarily wants to market. Uh, so I'm, t I'm thinking of, places where investment, you know, people have left and there's been divestment and we see things like illegal uh, dump sites and uh, burn downs overnight and, and other types of similar problems and also uh, disasters after disasters and so forth. There seems to be incredible potential. So my, que my question is, will you please consider uh, spinning up some sort of a social enterprise that, we, that uses this technology for civic good? We've tried. Um, Last year, we created a company called Terra Response and went to the city, met with the governor's staff, showcasing this technology because we had the idea of what we could do on a social piece, and this is after Joplin happened, was our ability to, if we had the right contracts and the right kind of funding, we can be within a disaster site within 12 hours, maybe even three, and be up in the air shooting everything that was a first responder piece that would the problem that a lot of people have these days is everything is either done through video or still imagery, which does not give you any relation. There's no spatial relationship whatsoever. And what we developed was a whole website and this whole concept that would allow you to go there to that specific city, see what happened, and actually go around from tour to tour, see what the damage is, let the first responders see you know, what really happened. Because what they're doing right now is one guy gets up in a helicopter, he's on his radio going around, trying to tell people where to go. Like when Joplin, the cops who grew up in those neighborhoods, they'd be standing on an intersection that they grew up at and they had no idea what it was. And the other piece that we can do with that is we had figured out a way to fund that as well. Um, 
what we wanted to do was create a funding piece because what happens is when there is an accident, the, uh, the people of the United States are very, very generous. They call Red Cross. They call all sorts of people to donate money. But that money, there's no real good place for that to go. What we were trying to do was create another piece that people could see the damage and then through that create a funding mechanism where they could donate directly that would go right to that community. Uh, you what? Okay. Okay. Well, get with me afterwards. We'd love to hear about it. But I, but I think the biggest reason that, A, we didn't have the funding, I mean, we had this tool to kind of say, hey, conceptualize government. This is what we can do. We can bring this to you. But then we ran into all the bureaucracy between everybody from the state level to Red Cross to you just name every organization. Because we didn't have a finished product to show them, it kind of dropped. But that is something that is high on our list someday. Question back here to your right. I just want to say that I think this is really amazing. And I'm curious, how did you conceptualize this idea? And at what point did you decide that there was a need for this technology? And what was it that made you pursue um, embarking on this journey? The, the concept was actually created by my two other partners um, five years ago. They were working on a real estate project uh, down, I think, in Branson. And they were trying to showcase a 200-acre development um, from the air and get good imagery. And they were in a little Cessna flying crosshatch patterns back and forth, hanging out, trying to take still photos, and then spent three weeks trying to Photoshop and map these out. And basically said, there's got to be a better way. And um, so I went back to the drawing board and spent a year just conceptualizing, you know, how do you take imagery from a moving obstacle a thousand feet in the air and keep it still and keep it good quality. And literally just one thing, our guys are very creative. Uh, one of my partners, named Max, is just amazing and uh, just locked himself in a room for many months and kind of came up, came up with a new camera rig that would allow us to do that. And then we all just think differently. Um, this is how, you know, this is how you see the world every single day of just a fixed piece that you can turn and look and allows you to understand waypoints and figure out where things are. Um, it just kind of fit in with the four partners, how we think and how we think the world should see things. And again, you know, you go to New York and you look at the Statue of Liberty and, all, and, and so many kids, they grow up and they just see this little tiny statue, and that's all they understand about New York. But if they could literally just spin and turn and see the relationship to the rest of the community in Ellis Island and where all these things came in and how important it was, you know, we can come in now and by scrolling over the statue, you can actually learn about it and you know, figure out who gave it to us, when it was built, and all these you know, informative pieces. And uh, you know, so our goal is to go into each city and really create that basic understanding. So we have time for one more question. Yeah. Really a suggestion. I saw the Royal Stadium and uh, the Arrowhead, and I said to myself, don't we hear about these small markets? The small markets, the Clevelands. Cleveland has a tr trouble drawing people. But if there was something that the people could do in addition to coming to the games, I think that's a target for you, is these, the Milwaukee's, the Cleveland's, the ones with the reputation that needs to be lifted. And that's what our goal is on the athletics piece, is that ability to get into that stadium, get, that, get the fans to really connect with that team. And we're in talks with MLB. You've got to be MLB BAM approved, which is really, really tough. Um, but that would give us full access to every stadium within the MLB and every team. And that would then allow us to get down in that stadium, create that imagery where you can see all the players on the team, scroll over them, get down into the locker room, and kind of create that fan experience that really helps draw people back in. And then the other thing is that kind of on a monetization side is we've developed a whole new social media buying platform that we've spent a lot of time developing. And we'll be launching that here pretty soon. So it's called Over City Offers. And kind of the big piece is our packages. And um, we know that with businesses and small businesses, they're getting hammered every day by 50% deals and people that come in and take 75% of their profits, or, in the, or just the overall net. And um, so what we figured out how to do is 
through our offers piece, we can now sell packages that is combining hotels, event tickets, dinners that are all local, that are discounted, but we're able to do a lot of this basically on a different financial level so those businesses are not getting hit as hard. And uh, really specializing on limited offerings where we'll sell 30, 40, 100 and turn it off. Um, so that allows us to provide year-round marketing, but yet sell these really quick hot deals, flash deals, turn them on, turn them off, but we'll have multiple going throughout the day, which again is driving people to our sites because they never know what's going to be for sale. And so it, I think a gentleman asked about a revenue model earlier of we just kind of rethought the social buying process and we really want to, you know, we want to make money, we want to be able to pay our employees, our mortgages, but we also want our customers which are the clients and everybody that is viewing this to get a good deal and have access to things. But the biggest thing that Google or Groupon, social media, or, uh, Living Social, they don't have a lot of retention in terms of the businesses that they utilize. You know, they kind of come in, they sell this really big package, they'll sell 20,000 hamburgers, but then they're out the door, they're gone. And then that business owner is left to deal with that mess. And they don't get a lot of people that come back. There's very few that come back year after year. And we think by restructuring this where it's just real quick, you get in, you get out, you promote, you show them better than anybody else has ever been able to do, you're going to create that good partnership. And that's what it's about. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut you off here because yeah. we're, we're out of time. And i got two, two things to touch on real quickly. First off, there was a concern whether or not July 3rd would bring out a lot of people. And it obviously did. It did. So we've got a room full of 200 plus people. Uh, what can we as a community do for you? We just need support. Um, everything is about usership. The big thing is Facebook. Come in and like us on Facebook. You get to hear about our specials. We give, we're like a radio station in terms of the products that we get. We hold contests. We give things away. And the other thing is if you go up to our site and you click sign up, it's a very simple process. Give us your contact information. You'll be put on our list. And then when we have these deals that we push out, you get notified. We're not going to do a notification every day. We're really going to try and pare it down to just a few a week to really promote the big deals and put quite a few things together. And um, talk about us, support us. We're local. We're trying everything we can to, to make Kansas City better. Great. I'm going to actually pass the same question back over to Gregory because we didn't get a chance to ask him. So what can we do for you as well um, as a community to support Oddly Correct? Yeah, that's great. Exactly what he said there. Kansas City is an amazing place. So um, whether it's Oddly Correct that you like support or... Um, thou mayest or Broadway, I say Kansas City, the reason it's amazing is because there's people like us trying to make a difference and um, get after it, you know? So I say maybe put down the mermaid. I know it's a siren, we'll call it a mermaid to insult it. You know, and maybe try, like, but overarching, the bigger idea is suspending your judgment um, and trying something new, whether it's food, whether it's coffee, um, whether it's speaking on stage, whatever it is. Um, our, our idea is basically like, oddly correct is not for everybody, but it's oddly correct for us. And what you're into is not right for everybody, but it's oddly correct for you. So I say go for it. So what you can do for us is just support local and, and really um, pursue your own kick-ass idea, for lack of a better language. Thanks. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. Same, same time, same place next week. We'll see you guys next week. Thanks.